Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Center for Naval Analyses in Northern Virginia, where uh, we are meeting with Sam Bendett, uh, who we had an opportunity to talk to at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show, where our uh, coverage was sponsored by Fincantieri, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo uh, DRS. Uh, Sam, you're here with uh, the Crack Russia team at, uh, at CNA. Um, and when uh, you and I spoke, you uh, mentioned, um, and you know, I, 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 I'm glad that I'm having an opportunity to follow up with you about Russian use of unmanned underwater vehicles off the Syria coast. Uh, but first, I want to start off with uh, the significance of uh, the Russian military's inclusion of unmanned vehicles in its upcoming May 9 parade. Uh, as everybody knows, that is the big celebration of the end of World War II. Uh, it's always a great patriotic day uh, from, uh, from, from Russia's victory or the Soviet Union's victory in the Great Patriotic War. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why uh, that's such an important event that unmanned vehicles would be included in this parade. Well, over the past couple of years, Russians have been developing and using a lot of UAVs, UUVs, and UGVs in combat, especially when it comes to unmanned aerial vehicles. They've proven themselves in Syria. They were sighted in Ukraine. Unmanned ground vehicles were used extensively for demining and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance duties, ISR, in Syria and elsewhere. So. The military parade on May 9th is usually an example and um, an exhibition of everything that Russia owns and everything that it operates. So going all the way back to uh, the 1940s to today. So it was just a matter of time and it made sense for Russians to include certain technologies that they are either using or want to incorporate. Well, what's interesting about this is that of the three uh, unmanned systems that they cited, only one was actually in combat. So Uran-6 demining vehicle was used extensively in Syria and will be continued to use and improved upon for the future. Russians are going to show Uran-9 unmanned ground vehicle. Now that is the one that looks like a small tank. It's a great PR tool. It's one of the largest UGVs that Russians own today. It hasn't been in combat, but it has been going extensive. Uh, it's, it has been undergoing extensive testing and evaluation. So in the near future, um, officially, Russians are saying that they will include that into services. And then uh, a UAV that they're going to show has also been under development. Well, what's interesting is that they're not actually including certain UAVs that have seen combat and have been used extensively. The um, uh, Farpost UAV, which is an Israeli searcher produced in Russia under license, uh, the Orlan UAV, which is Russia's biggest uh, UAV workhorse, uh, half of the Russian UAV fleet is actually made up of Orlans, and many others. So. Obviously, Russians are going for aesthetics. Everybody wants to see a uh, military robot that looks like a small tank, uh, but they're leaving some of the other unmanned key systems out, maybe for the future parades or maybe for other reasons. Um, so from an American perspective, we always like to believe that we're actually leaders in unmanned technology, um, given that some of the more ambitious systems, certainly whether it's, it's Reaper or whether it's the Triton, uh, are very prominent. But from the standpoint of, of um, you know, and also much smaller ground vehicles that we use in Iraq and Afghanistan as well, all the way from sort of handheld size things all the way to larger ones, Russia has built a formidable autonomous vehicle capability then. True. The United States is the leader and probably will continue to be the leader in numbers of unmanned systems used in a variety of missions, especially when it comes to aerial vehicles, especially when it comes to land systems. But I think the use of unmanned systems is changing. For the United States, uh, which did not face a comparable enemy in, um, in the last two decades of engagement, uh, most of UAVs were in the intelligence surveillance uh, surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance excuse me, capacity. And uh, when it comes to UAVs, it was essentially um, a, a combat UAV that would hit the target once it was identified. Uh, these type of unmanned systems did not face any significant countermeasures and did not face any significant um, technological challenges. Well, what the Russians are saying right now is that they have learned from the American lessons in use of unmanned systems and are now trying to experiment with other types of unmanned systems going forward. So while they have their own ISR UAVs and while they have their own small UGVs for demining or uh, intelligence and reconnaissance duties, they're now trying to build larger unmanned ground vehicles for 
potential land combat. And this is where the equation changes. Now, um, they're only starting to experiment with that. Um, they are saying that certain UGVs will be included in military services. But the big question right now is, how will the Russians incorporate such, such systems? What will be the concept of operations? How will such UGVs, uh, which are armed and can be potentially used in combat, be actually used with manned formations? How will they be incorporated into other um, military systems? So United States leads in the quality, in the electronics, in the numbers of unmanned systems. But the Russians are beginning to change the equation of how some of these UAVs uh, and UGVs will be used. Um, how does, uh, you and I talked briefly about this, but how does the philosophy, the Russian philosophy of how these systems will be used change? Because Russia has always been an intellectual military leader. Uh, it continues to be that, whether it, how it thinks about problems. Uh, talk to us, you know, and the Russians have said that they always want to maintain the man in the loop on these systems, which is very consistent with what American military leaders say. But then there are people who actually bear, you know, a, a question about whether or not Russia would actually do that in the event that the, the chips are down. Um, explore that a little bit more with me. You know, it, 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 is there certainty that Russia will maintain man in the loop, or is it something that that globally this discussion is changing? You know, if you already start listening to American leaders, they're beginning to hedge on that, in part because of, of the position that the enemy always gets a vote. So we may want to keep the man in the loop somehow, but how do you keep a man in the loop, for example, with swarming systems that have hundreds that are coming at you or going out at the same time? You know, how, how, how certain is the fact that the Russians would, would would abide by such ethical limits when it comes to using these systems in high intensity combat? Well, that's a big question mark right now. Uh, Russians themselves don't know how combat will evolve for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, there are theories of how that will happen, and certainly unmanned systems will play very heavily in future combat. But uh, certainly unmanned systems will play um, a significant role in, um, in the future combat. What's not clear is how technology will develop. And so right now, Russians are saying, yes, we would like to keep a human in the loop, no matter how difficult the situation becomes. And they're also talking about the certain levels of autonomy that such unmanned systems should have in combat. Again, a lot of that will depend how far the technology will go to, the, to Russians. This type of conversation is mostly theoretical because technology hasn't actually caught up with the current debates. And that was one of their significant points that they made at the United Nations uh, um, law of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems conversations. They're saying, look, right now, all of this is in the future. The technology is not here yet. And therefore, us talking with certainty about how unmanned systems will or will not behave is a moot point. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to gradually build up certain levels of autonomy for various systems, especially when it comes to land systems. They're small tanks, they're uh, small unmanned tanks, the mid-sized UGVs with machine guns, uh, mortars, and other weapons. Uh, again, it's an experimental space. There's no great certainty. And the unmanned systems that Russians have built so far are in small numbers. So even when they're accepted into service, a certain time will pass before Russians figure out exactly how they should or could be used. And once again, when it comes to ethics, it's not a question of ethics to the Russians. It's a question of technology. How far can technology develop that would allow for a coherent and logical discussion on what the unmanned systems can and cannot do, rather than trying to predict what that would look like in the future? I want to ask you about unmanned underwater vehicles. During our interview, um, you, you mentioned that, that the Russians are using a whole series of unmanned systems, air, ground, uh, as well as seaborne, as well as unmanned underwater vehicles off the Syrian coast. And I thought that's fascinating, and that was the, the kernel of this discussion that we're having today. Um, and there's also been some news flow on that in, right. in terms of a, of a, of, uh, of a news story that, that came out. I love the fact that in the in the picture, there are also two, two Russian atomic icebreakers in the back of the picture. Right. Uh, everybody who knows me knows how big of an icebreaker fan I am. Talk to us a little bit about what the Russians are doing in the unmanned underwater vehicle space, what the vehicle that was used off of Syria was used, you know, what, what, what is the vehicle that was used off of Syria, and why on earth are the Russians using an unmanned underwater vehicle off of Syria? 
Well, unmanned underwater vehicle development is the key development across many top militaries around the world. Uh, the number one mission for such vehicles is to see and to hear what is happening below the waves. Uh, this is usually the hardest mission for any Navy. Um, usually uh, surface vessels have limited capacity to see what's happening below the waves. So unmanned underwater vehicles that can go to depths of thousands of meters and can go hundreds of kilometers out from their um, launch point are great mission multipliers. And the United States is certainly leading that effort right now along with its allies. Russians aren't that far behind. And a lot of uh, manufacturers of submarines are now getting in the business of building unmanned underwater vehicles. It is the future for the Russian Navy and such unmanned underwater as well as surface vehicles will form a significant portion of military equipment on Russian vessels below and above the water. And so at the previous event I mentioned a specific UUV called Galtel which was monitoring and um, gathering information off the Syrian coast. So it was uh, mapping um, was mapping the, uh, the floor bottom, and it was trying to essentially be the eyes and ears for the Russian Navy. Um, it was the first such trial for this particular UUV. It was the first time we heard that a UUV was used in a combat setting, uh, such as Syria, and uh, the Russians were probably built on that. What's significant about Galtel is that its operational system was essentially um, uh, a machine learning system, and Russians announced that uh, it was an AI-driven UUV. What that means is that Galtel was able to orient on, on its own, and it was able to change mission parameters as required. Now, we don't know exactly what happened. Russians are kind of mom on that. But from the news that they were able to publicly announce, it's interesting to see that uh, they're now trying to use UUVs and other unmanned systems in a near combat setting. The news today was specifically about uh, a different type of a UUV called clavicin. It is essentially going to be a UUV in a box. Now, previously, certain unmanned underwater and surface vehicles were designed for mission on certain vessels, and that's certainly going to be the future as well. But this UUV could be operational either from shore or from any vessel. It is essentially a container with an unmanned underwater vehicle in it. And so it could be operated and launched by any crew from any vessel. Uh, this particular UUV can go to depths of several thousand meters and can be autonomous for a very long time. And it is also an ISR UUV, so the eyes and ears of the Russian Navy, so that they could see what is happening below the waves. They can track the su enemy submarines and other ships. Uh, what's also significant is that they're saying that it could be dual-use unmanned underwater vehicle, for example, in search and rescue operations. And, and uh, contrast the two vehicles, the one that was used, the Galtel, and then the new one, in terms of their uh, size and their, and their footprint, because the new, new UUV looks like it's about maybe three meters long, about nine or so feet. Right. Uh, these are very similar in size. Um, uh, certain information about Galtel um, is classified, but uh, from, from public statements, um, these type of UUVs are going to be on the smaller size. Again, uh, the key here is simplicity of use and ease of operations. The larger the UUV, the more expensive it is to operate, the more complex it is to operate. So um, Galtel and Clavicin are essentially in the same category. And one question is um, that's come up in conversation after conversation is um, the similarities between how Russia is cycling its troops through uh, Syria on air, land, and sea in order to be able to, the, the professional officer cadre can get experience. Uh, very similar to, you know, you don't want to make World War II analogies here, but the way the Germans used uh, the Spanish Civil War to cycle through air leaders, ground leaders, and as Soviet well as on Union the- Soviet Union used it as well. And the Soviet Union used it uh, as well, I, I, uh, exactly. Talk to us about how effective that's been in growing a, uh, or seasoning uh, Russian military leaders. Well, this is the first overseas conflict of its kind that Russia has been involved in since the fall of Soviet Union. So for them, it was very significant. It was also the type of conflict where, uh, in many ways, they fought in, in a similar fashion to the U.S. actions in Iraq and Afghanistan, sort of a small mission footprint, use of unmanned systems, use of various um, air and land assets, use of modern communications. So as far as the new look of the Russian military, the training that the Russian military 
needs and the weapons that it has to use. Syria uh, experience is absolutely crucial. And so, as you've mentioned, a large number of flag officers, military commanders, as well as uh, tens of thousands of troops have gone through that particular conflict so that uh, they could develop their concept of operations, their tactics, techniques, and procedures for a modern way of combat. Uh, Russians are claiming that combat in Syria is the harbinger of things to come, so that future conflicts are going to be similar to what happened in Syria. So from the standpoint of the Russian military, cycling as many of its soldiers and as many of its military technologies through is absolutely crucial to prepare for that type of future war. And let me follow up on the um, cooperation between the Israelis and the Russians, which is not new, but it is something still that's, that's interesting. Talk to us a little bit about that relationship and how both of them are actually trying to move as far away from that, uh, you know, folks talking about it as, as, as they can. Well, seven or eight years ago, Russia and Israel uh, made a deal where Russia imported two small UAVs from Israel, a hand-launched bird-eye UAV, which became Russian Zastava, which has been heavily used, and a larger, more capable searcher UAV, which became Russian Farpost. Farpost is Russia's largest and uh, longest-ranged UAV, has been used extensively in a domestic and international setting. Uh, that was the extent of that cooperation. It wasn't significantly renewed, and Russians are now building these UAVs under license. In fact, they're going to build modernized versions of our post, which will essentially be a completely Russian-made UAV rather than it being made from Israeli supply parts. And uh, how large are both of these? Right, one is handheld. How large is Far Post, roughly from a dimensional standpoint? Well, uh, Far Post essentially is the size of a, a small aircraft. Uh, it, it cannot be launched by a catapult. It needs a runway for its operations. It is also the longest range, so its range is about 120 or so miles. So Russians are now using it extensively as an ISR platform and as a test bed for future operational use. And the Israelis have been supplying parts to them or, yeah, you know, because it's kind of an unusual relationship if you consider it, uh, that Israel is sort of on the other side of this conflict or on the right, uh, or on the same side of it, depending on the time of day. Um, how does that relationship work? So they supplied kits so that uh, Russians could build the uh, searcher far post UAV uh, in Russia. Uh, and uh, that was the extent of that deal. It was one of the most expensive deals Russia made of its kind. Well, what's interesting is that Russians have decided to plug the gap in their uh, UAV technology with an import. And it was one and probably the only time they've done that. Russians are not, to any knowledge, importing any other uh, UAV technology um, in order to build them under license. So they went for an older Israeli model, but a model that is very capable and model that has ex essentially proven itself very well in the Russian military. The big question everybody's asking is the performance of those troops. You know, if you listen to some folks, they look at Russia's performance as, as uh, extraordinary. Others say it's average. Others say it's, it's not as good as everybody thinks it is. From your perspective, I know that a lot of what you have is very classified, but insofar as you can discuss that, what's the right way for American mil military leaders or even the American public or the academic community to think about Russia's performance, how good it is relative to what our mental models of it might be? Because I think some folks still bear in the back of their mind the missteps that Russia made in Georgia. They bear in the back of their minds the missteps, for example, that were made in Ukraine, uh, where, you know, certain capabilities were dis dis displayed that were impressive, but then there was a whole bunch of other things that was less impressive. You know, folks will say in Syria, it's, it's good to, you know, you can be effective from the air if you're very imprecise, for example, which was the criticism of Russian, Russian forces. Talk to us a little bit, insofar as you can, about what is the truest picture of Russia's performance as it cycles these leaders through this conflict and, and demonstrates new capabilities. The best way to answer that is to compare the performance of the Russian military over the past two and a half years to the Russian-Georgian War of 2008, when Russia was at the very beginning of its uh, modernization and restructuring drive to modernize the military, to retrain the military, to essentially make it more modern and more capable. And there's a huge difference between the Russian military performance then 
and in the Syrian conflict when it comes to capabilities, when it comes to professionalism, and when it comes to the use of new and improved and even older technologies. So today's Russian military is a lot more capable and a lot more dangerous than the Russian military of the 2008 war. Sam Bennett of the Center for Naval Analyses, part of the crack uh, Russia team here. Sam, always a pleasure and look forward Thank to you. staying in touch with you and others uh, here to give our audience regular updates on what the Russians are up to. My pleasure.